Today, I'm delighted to welcome Diane Gersten, Chief Human Resources Officer, IBM, to the Digital HR Leaders podcast. Welcome to the show, Diane. Thanks very much for sharing your time with our listeners. Can you provide a quick introduction to your background and current role at IBM, please? Sure, uh, David, I'm delighted to be here. So thanks for inviting me. I'm Diane Gerson. I'm the Chief Human Resource Officer at IBM. Uh, I've been in the role now for seven years and uh, grew up actually in consulting and went into HR about uh, 19 years ago, 18 or 19 years ago, uh, out of consulting and joined IBM as the head of comp and bank. And then after that moved into a series of other HR leadership roles. Great, well, as I said, it's, it's great to have you on the show. Um, you know, we've been running the podcast now for about 15 months, and we know that the majority of our listeners work in HR, uh, and many aspire to one day be a CHRO. Um, I think it'd be great if we could shed some some light on the role, maybe, and if you could maybe describe a typical day, if, if there is such a thing, um, in the life of a, of, of a CHRO at a Fortune 50 company. Well, sure. I don't know if there is a typical day. Uh, I would say there isn't, right? But I, I think for anyone who aspires, the most important thing is that you have an agenda, right? Because there's a, a tendency for everyone else to take over your day, and then you can finish the day and go, I didn't accomplish anything you know, that I needed to do, right? So um, that's actually the most wonderful thing about a CHRO is that you do get to define your day. You get to define your priorities. Um, and then you force fit your schedule against those priorities, right? So that's um, that's a great, I think it's a great thing to be able to do as a CHRO. I think up until then, I was pretty much at the mercy of other people's schedules, but uh, but now it's um, it's that's the that's the joy of being a CHRO. And how how much has that has that changed at all during the crisis? And you know, there was an article I think you featured in in the Economist a few months ago. And it talked about how the CHRO is almost like the CFO was during the financial crisis, where acting at the center of the crisis for the organization. Is it, has it changed the, changed the role for you at all? It really has. I mean, we're on constant calls, as I know all of your listeners are as well, um, to talk about the state of the emergency that we're all in that has now become everyday life. Um, it started out very much as a crisis. We met every day and um, met for at least an hour, and we were working out all the crisis issues. Now um, now it's more of a steady state, but it's still three times a week. Um, so that's that's definitely a difference. How we meet is different, of course. We're now meeting, um, uh, in our case, on WebEx. And, um, and so that's, uh, that's a lot different than how we used to meet. But, um, but I, I think other than that, it's, it's pretty much the same. It's a, it's, um, it, it, working from home is, uh, as, for, as I know it is for everybody else, just really hard to define the difference between work and home. Yeah. And I think we all are working much longer hours than ever. Uh, but that's, that's the reality of living in COVID. Yeah, I think, I think when, when a crisis happens, people kind of step up and they, they don't, really don't mind working longer. Um, there's maybe a bit more flexibility. I've, I've seen studies out there that suggest people are working longer hours, but maybe they're, having, they're, they're taking the time, if they can, during the day to, to you know, if they, especially if they're child caring and, and, and stuff like that as well. So, uh, right. so it'll, be, it'll be interesting. I think I'm sure lots of research is already underway in the crisis. And there'll be obviously some of those studies will be published over the, the next year or two years or so. I think the other thing that's different is travel, of course, because we're not traveling and that frees up a lot more time. Uh, one of my colleagues is something great, which we've been copying, and that is that um, he decided to, uh, you know, spend a day in, in or spend a week in Asia Pacific. All right. So he's in North America, spent a week in Asia Pacific. So what did he do? He got up in the middle of the night and started his day. And he did it as though you were doing a trip, right? So in other words, um, you know, it's not just having one meeting, you have a series of meetings. You meet yeah. sometimes with large groups, sometimes one-on-one -on -one with people that you're mentoring, you have lunch with them, order in, you know, and now it's the middle of the night in North America, but for them it's lunch, order in sushi because I'm in Japan and so forth. And literally went through an entire week of this in Asia Pacific and I think, you know, that to me is the kind of innovation that we need to have because we have to keep up those informal relationships. Yeah. And there's a danger that we're still in this transactional, I have a Zoom call, it started at 10, it ends at 11, and we get done what we need to do. If you were in the room in the meeting, you'd have chit chat before and chit chat after, right? Um, and that's when, that's where you form those bonds that are so important in a company. And 
Um, and so to be able to do a trip, a trip in quotation marks like that, you're able to simulate it, which I think is just, um, just really, really a great idea and something that we're all now emulating. Yeah, I, I, that's a great idea, especially if you're in a global role. And as you said, people on the other side of the, of, of the world actually get to get some time with you. And you said that that all important informal, informal time, because, you know, unfortunately, the way that Zoom calls are, yes, you might have a little bit of chit chat before the before the, you get going into the business, but it's not the same as, as being face to face, is it? So, um, so the Economist article that I, I referenced earlier, I and mean, it, it, it also referenced that four fifths of CEOs are worried about skill shortages. Um, I, I know from my time at IBM, you know, the Institute for Business Value found that the time it takes to close the skills gap through training increased from an average of three days in 2014 to 36 days in 2018, which is actually quite staggering. Um, skills, I've heard it called the new currency, which I, I quite like that. And I know that there is the, you know, what is the importance of skills at IBM and how have you tackled this challenge? So skills is central to IBM. Uh, we are, after all, a tech company, and the short the shelf life of skills is very short in technology. So um, the way they talk about it is a half life, which means that half of what you learned five years ago is no longer relevant. Um, and so that is pretty scary. And in some areas, it's actually three years. So that means you've got to continue to grow your skills. And um, and so for us. As we pivoted uh, into cloud, into AI, into cybersecurity, it was really important that everyone understand those skills and build those skills. And so we made that really central, not, not just to you know, how we talked about the experience in IBM, but also having the right platform that was truly infectious, that made learning a habit um, and having leaders emulate it, actually publishing figures about, um, about how many hours leaders were consuming of skills and, and their badges. Um, so, so this is all important in terms of building a culture that where skills is important. And I think one of the one of the products that, that you guys um, have built to actually help that bit is your learning. You know, can you tell listeners a little bit about your learning and how it works, and and, and what employees like about it? Yeah. So your learning is um, we threw out our ATS system when we just decided to to do this in, instead, and it's a very simple system built on our cloud. Um, and it has internal and external everything, you know, whether it's a YouTube or um, video or, or whether it's a Stanford business course or, or an MIT course or an internal course, whatever, it's all there. But, um, but, the, but the, what's so great about it is it's personalized and it's built just like Netflix. And so it knows who you are, knows what you did last time, knows um, what your career aspirations are, and, it, and it, it has a recommendation engine that recommends to you what you should take next. Um, and like Netflix, you can queue it up. So, so for example, you know, I was talking with someone the other day who said, you know, I, this was before COVID, I used to go into, um, you know, get my nails done every Saturday. And so I would always queue up a, a, a learning while I was getting my nails done because for anyone who gets their nails done, they know how annoying it is that you can't do anything except listen with your earbuds while, you're, while your, your nails are drying. So, um, so there you go. So you can do it, you can fit it into your day and it's queued up for you. And that I think has been really great. The other thing is that you, we have um, badges. And so badges give people sort of the ability to move into new roles with their skills. Um, and um, and that's been that's been quite effective. Um, we've connected it to career in a really important way in that it shows what are the hot skills in IBM, where do we have demand? Um, and also where does the market have demand? Because we scrape all of the um, postings that all of our competitors have out there in their, uh, for their jobs. And so we're able to surface where, where where's demand going in terms of skills. And, um, and so people can, can then start aligning their career goals and their uh, learning goals with, with where the market is going, which is, which is quite helpful. And also it helps them understand that their current skills may not actually have a lot of traction in the market, which is also important to know and important to career discussions. And then finally, it'll surface jobs that are open inside of IBM that match your skills. So you can sign up for a service that, com that comes and tells you every time a job opens where, David, you know, here's a job that you have an 80% match. Do you want to apply? Um, or you can just go and look. So it's, um, it's, it's all connected to the Your Learning platform. 
And I think that's the clever thing. It kind of pulls together that learning and mobility and, and then presumably on the back end workforce planning for IBM as well. That's right. In, in the past, all these things have not, not, I'm not talking about IBM here, but in the past in organization, most of these things have been done separately, but these are, it's kind of linking these talent programs together. It's such a great point, David. I mean, we had, we had learning in a different organization from skills. And um, what I did was I did a squad for six months and I pulled the head of learning into our um, skills organization and magic happened. You know, suddenly your career and your learning came together. Suddenly we had all sorts of incredible innovation that hadn't been happening when learning was sitting in its own silo. Um, so, you know, so it is really important to do that, to shake things off a bit, to get that kind of synergy, because as you say, that's how the employee thinks, you know, learning and career go together. Uh, and so, yes, it is really important that we bring our own teams together to make things happen. Yeah. And as an employee, if you're going to take the time to, to take some learning, you want to see what career opportunities it, it can give. And then also the demand for those skills that you would be acquiring, um, within the organization as well, and potential career paths. So it just, it just you know, far better for the employee experience, really. Right, right. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, we've been hearing a lot about um, the crisis and COVID-19 acting as an accelerant to, to digital transformation and the future of work. You know, what, continuing that skill thing, what has been the impact on skills at IBM and what has been the response of HR? Well, look, I think a, a lot of it is listening, right? Listening and um, showing empathy has been the most important part of what HR has been about. Um, and the second part is making sure people are safe and, um, and that it, it, when they do come into uh, an IBM environment that they feel safe. And um, so, so those are, uh, I guess, kind of at the bottom of the Maslow's hierarchy, right? You know, sort of safety being the most important thing. And HR hasn't spent a lot of time on that, you know, for many, many, many years. And suddenly it rose to the fore. So it drew on skills that many, particularly early professional HR folks, had not actually had to exercise. So it's been, um, I think, a great exercise in, um, in really um, causing HR folks to blossom in terms of their skill sets and listening, how they listen, how they co-create with their, with, their, with their teams and also with the folks that they support. Um, has become a really important f factor. And, and then on top of that, of course, we've had um, racial justice and, and social justice issues right on top of that. And, and that just accentuated many of those very same things. Yeah, and actually continuing that theme really, you know, um, and I know that, that this is something that I've seen when I was at IM actually, staying with the crisis. What have you done at IBM to support employees around return to the workplace, as well as the new ways of working that will May, may well be part of the new normal whenever the new normal uh, appears. Yeah. yeah, we well, it looks like COVID is here to stay, right? So, I, so I, I think right. we're beyond the point of thinking we're all going to go back to the office and it'll be the same. But what, no, we actually back in the uh, beginning of June, we decided to do an all employee jam. And so each of our senior leaders each um, held a conversation room and um, and we had our employees come in and we had a series of questions for them that we discussed. And one of them was, what's the future of the office? Another one was, um, you know, what do you value about working from home and what do you miss about the office? And so we got a lot of input from our own people around uh, how they would envisage going back to work uh, when things are safer. And, um, and that's an important element, right? Because if it's not safe, then that's a different discussion. But, um, but what we got was about two thirds of our employees really value the office as a hub. They value the office as a place to go, to build a network, to learn uh, from others, to be mentored, um, to build community. And they really value that. I, I, the other third would be perfectly happy staying at home forever. Um, and those tended to be people who were later in career, had already built out their network, you know, didn't, maybe didn't have a lot of career ambitions from where they are today, um, but they're just as valuable as those mentors, right? I mean, you know, and we had to remind them, well, what about when you were an early professional, you know, who mentored you? And so there's some of that that needs to happen is the give back, right? And um, so we are thinking about the office as um, not a place to get your work done. We all know you can get that done at home, um, but it, it's a place for, for you to build community and to build culture. And obviously IBM was one of the pioneers of remote working anyway, but I think back in the, back in the 80s or 90s even. Um, and I think what's an interesting topic that we're seeing is 
um, for some of the companies that we're working with is we you looking at the t a different people have different opinions as you said about wanting to be spending more time in the office or less time in the office but there's also the types of work there's been studies saying that people feel more productive but at, at what cost is probably the the the, the, the counterpoint I'd, I'd make to that and that, but the other thing is the types of work that maybe you can do remotely more pro product productive you know more with more productivity and then there's the types of work where actually innovation and, and create, creative work really it perhaps it's better in a, in a face to face basis and you you can see a future where maybe people are at home two or three days a week but they're in the office to do certain types of work and I, 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 a, a, fas, a fascinating study I guess for yeah for analytics. No, you're absolutely right David and one of the conversation rooms that we had was about innovation and and, and it's really clear that that serendipitous encounters are critical to innovation and when you think about you know, the work that we do right now, it's pretty much all pre-programmed, right? I mean, we have a Zoom call and, you know, it's these people were invited. We didn't bump into anybody. <laughs> and uh, and so there's uh, there's that random, um, random encounters that cause people to think differently. Um, they expand their networks and so forth. And so there's some of it that you can do. Um, certainly we have found that, you know, the use of, for example, the use of Slack uh, channels has been a great way to build out networks. Um, and you can have those random, you know, one minute conversations with people. And, uh, and so that tends to, to be okay, but it's, there's nothing better than, you know, running into somebody in the hallway or the lunchroom. So, um, so I think there's, there's that, and, and we will definitely be thinking, um, about, uh, innovation, particularly sprints to come into the office for that. One of the reasons is, you know, it's really hard to be on Zoom for hours on end, right? So if you're working in a, on a, in a very compressed way on a project where, you, you know, you're on a sprint, you need to get something delivered, you can't work for four days straight, you know, sitting on video, but you could work in an office four days straight with, even with a mask and six foot distancing and get it done in, in, and take breaks and so forth together. Um, and, and, and there's, so we've been experimenting with that, but, um, but it's still early days, still early days. Yeah. I mean, I suppose when the crisis started, no one knew how long it would last and, you know, and I saw lots of stuff about return to, to return to the office and the new normal. And I was like, well, we don't, we're not really near the new normal yet. And we've seen some companies making big announcements about going either completely virtual or nearly wholly virtual. Um, but I think it's a, probably a little bit more nuanced than that, as you said, because A, different employees have different preferences. B, there's different types of work that needs done. And then also different organizations have different needs. I mean, obviously, as a technology organization, IBM's created its history really on being a very innovative organization. So, um, you know, that that time together is, is, is important. Um, there's no, yeah, there's I mean, you no mentioned way. IBM went remote early and we did um, and we learned a lot from it. And what we learned was that we went early when there was the Internet. Right. And people were mostly on the phone and they were multitasking. We didn't get their full attention. They they um, they confused the you know being um, on back to back meetings with being productive, <laughs> and uh, and so we realized that wasn't working. Plus, we were moving to an agile way of working, which requires close collaboration and interactive uh, in iteration and interaction all the time, and um, and that's best done in person. So, so what we'd done with the early version of remote was we had taken what, what I would call an industrial model of work where I do my piece of work, I throw it over the transom to you, you work on it, you throw it over the transom to Ian. That, that worked fine remote, but then when we started doing agile work, it was less effective. Now what we found is actually there are much better virtual collaboration tools and we can do virtual uh, agile. And that has really enabled us to do it very differently than what I would call um, remote 1.0, you know, which is what yeah. we were doing um, five or 10 years ago. And that has made a big difference. I'll give you an example. Um, we got a new CEO, as you probably know, in April. And I had planned a three-day offsite or two-day offsite with this senior team, which is what one does when one has a new CEO. Um, and, you know, you sort of, what, what do we like and not like? How do we want to operate together as a team? You know, put together your own team manifesto and so forth. And, uh, of course, that was in April. So what did we do? We actually did it virtually. But we used... Um, 
we use Mural, which is a, uh, you know, if you haven't used it, an incredible I experience where it's kind of a whiteboard um, and you're pulling off stickies and it's as though you were in front of a whiteboard as a team. And um, we got a tremendous amount done. Now we did it over a period of five sessions instead of two days. Um, and they were about uh, 90 minutes or two hours each, but we got a lot out there. We, we um, learned a lot about each other. We, um, we shared what we, you know, what we aspired to be as a team. It was, uh, it was the kind of thing that we never would have imagined we could possibly have done except in person. But, you know, we were forced by circumstances. And now my senior team is really, really comfortable with using this kind of technology with their own teams. So that's, um, so that's one of the blessings, I think, of being forced into it is COVID has really, you know, shaved maybe five years off of, um, off of uh, what we would have done under normal circumstances, just because we were, you know, we were put in that situation. It certainly forced us to adapt. Uh, and then embrace, as you said, maybe technologies that we wouldn't have embraced, you know, in 2020, maybe, as you said, maybe it would have been in, in the next five years. So really interesting. I, I know we both share a, a passion for people analytics, data-driven HR, and, and I, I, use, use of AI in HR as well. And obviously, IBM has been one of the pioneers of this. I know from my time at the, at the company, the leading role that you played in, the, in that agenda as well. You know, as a CHRO, how does AI help you? Wow, that's a huge question, David. Um, AI is uh, is how we how we lead, right? I mean, it, it enables us first of all to sense what's going on in in ways that you you can't normally. I mean, I just talked about how we did a jam. We yeah. were able to feed back, you know, within um, a, an hour. You know, here's here here were the findings, right? So um, to be able to to look at negative versus positive, neutral, where do people agree, not agree? I mean, those that was all using AI, right? So that's a great a great example of how it just gives you a feel for what's going on in your organization, um, and uh, and and we didn't really have that before. Um, the other thing that it it does is it improves the employee experience. Um, so I talked earlier about personalization. It's, you know, we expect that. I mean, we now expect consumer grade experiences at work, but um, but that's all made possible by AI, knowing who you are, knowing what role you're in, feeding you a message that makes sense for you, as opposed to a, you know, dear IBM or message that you might've gotten before that you'd, you know, not even read because you're so used to them not being relevant to you. Um, so, you know, so those, those are things that I think can really affect the IBM or experience. Of course, being able to, you know, use a chat bot um, that is uh, 24 by seven on your phone to answer questions and to do transactions for you. Um, so, you know, we have right now um, about 250,000 interactions a month using our RHR chat bots. And the um, experience is very, very high and people love it. People love your learning. It has an NPS score of 53, which is better than most products on the marketplace. So, you know, people, people are giving feedback, we're making it better, but it's the AI that they love about it. Um, it makes managers better managers, just giving managers advice about what size of an increase to give their people based on the demand for their skills, based on uh, their performance and so forth, but really taking it all into account and, and that way enabling the manager when they give the increase to that person to say why, you know, you, you were a high performer, but you didn't grow your skills and the demand for your skills is low and the turnover rate for people with your skills is low. And, you know, that's why you didn't get an increase this year, but let's have a conversation about what skills you need to grow in order to continue to, to, um, you know, grow your, your, your career and your pay. Um, so it's, it's, it's enabled that it, it enables us to infer skills, um, so that people don't have to sit down and, you know, go through massive questionnaires so that we can inventory them. It's real time. Um, so that's been very, very helpful for workforce management. And of course it's enabled productivity, um, you know, using robotic product process automation. I mentioned the chat bots. Um, that's, that's really enabled us to move our own HR employees to higher level duties. And, um, and so if, from that perspective, it's really helped our productivity. Yeah, the inference of skills things, I think is very interesting because a lot of the organizations that we speak to, you know, they have that problem that every organization seems to have at some point that 
you know, some a, a tool like LinkedIn knows more about their people than, than they do in terms of the skills that they profess to have. Right. Um, and as you said, a lot of the, a lot of organisations then go through the process of asking people for their skills and trying to document that in. But the the inference thing is is very interesting, and and I know it's it's certainly supported workforce planning and understanding people's um, agility to to learn new skills um, that, that that may be in high demand in IBM. So you can actually target the, the right people to, to to try and shift, you know, to to to, to help them get to those into those roles. I mean, can you share a little bit more about that at all? I think that's something I know our listeners are interested in. Yeah, so look, it, it looks at your digital footprint. And um, and so, of course, what's really important in IBM is skills aren't just what you know, but what you share. You know, that's a very important value in IBM. And so you are sharing it. It's in your digital footprint in some way, um, whether it's in, it could be in your project um, summaries, it could be in what you, uh, what your pipeline is, if you're a seller. I mean, it's, it's, it's all over, right? Um, and um and so what we, we then use experts in each of the fields and each of the industries to validate it over a series of years. Um, just this year is the first time across all of IBM, we went to every single IBM or in the course of their career discussions to say, here's what we've inferred about your skills, not just, not just what skills you have, but at what level. And we would like you to validate that. And interestingly, 80% validated them at 100% accurate. Um, now, you know, does that mean 20% of them were wrong? We don't know yet. We still got some work to do on that. My hunch is maybe 50% were wrong of that, um, but the others maybe were over-evaluating their skills. So we're in the process of taking a look at that, but that's, we've got 350,000 employees. So that's not, that's not too bad. Um, and and it, it, it is something that, if skills are important to you, it's really important to invest in, in my mind, um, because people don't, A, don't have the time and nor the interest to keep updating their skills in some massive inventory thing. Um, but secondly, um, there is bias that you get when people do that. And um, even from the manager who might have to validate it, which is another whole exercise that is not yeah. much fun to do. Um, and and so, so in fact, the view, our view is that the human bias is eliminated through this process um, and that it is more, more accurate in the end. And so that, that's pretty exciting. It's, um, it's, it's a little scary to think about the fact that, you know, a machine is doing this. And so I do think this transparency is important. And, um, and I'm so glad that we did that this year. I've been pushing for it for a while and we, for a variety of reasons, we just weren't ready for it. But, um, but I do think, you know, people do have a right to know, um, you know, what skills you attribute to them. Yeah, yeah, I definitely, definitely would agree with you there. I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, HR itself. And I, it, it, and I know we're going to come to it, but this one point, I think, to, to what you just said um, previously. Um, so almost what technology and what personalized and the, the personalization of that enables us is it's almost a huge shift in HR from, we used to have these kind of one size fits all HR programs of the past. And this is now very much more like a consumer like product effectively or product set of products that is allowing us to personalize everything for individuals that must have a huge impact on, on the employee experience. It really does. You know, I think HR, the HR I inherited um, was very process bound. Right. And, and for good reason. I mean, HR hadn't been all that um, efficient in, in, the, in the old days. And um, there was a need for re-engineering and globalization. Every country had its own whatever recruiting system and so forth. Um, so that was all important. Um, but it became, it became incredibly effective for HR and incredibly horrible as, as a user. And um, users were having to stitch together solutions for themselves. So if you were onboarding, you'd have to go, you know, to one place for your benefits and somewhere else to get your badge and somewhere else again to get your, you know, your, your laptop um, to be, to be uh, connected to the internal internet and, and so forth. And it was, it, every one of those processes might have been efficient, but the experience was lousy. And so w instead of looking at efficiency, we actually adopted an experience lens and all of my teams are measured on net promoter score, which is how, you know, how, did, how was your experience, whatever it was. Um, and, and so that's one. And the second thing is each of our functions 
no longer have programs, they have offerings. Now that may sound like that's just a semantic change, but it's a mindset change. And when you talk about an offering, it means you've got someone at the other end of it, you know, and they might have a point of view about how it was received by them. <laughs> and that point of view is important. So, um, so talking about offering managers instead of program managers, I think has also made a difference. And what has been the reaction of the business? I mean, a huge shift in the, what HR is providing to, to the employees, but also a huge shift in what the value of, 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 of HR affects to the business. What's been the reaction of, of business leaders in IBM? Well, you know, look, I mean, HR is really viewed as having become a digital organization, um, which makes them very proud uh, because, of course, that's a business that we're in and we're using all of our own technology. So it's a showcase for how you can use all of it. Right. Um, and that that's been really important to our, our leadership team. Um, the other thing is that the HR team is no longer, you know, buried in transactions. They're actually spending time on helping them be greater leaders, um, helping their teams develop the skills that they need and adding real value to the business. And, and I think, you know, we've moved from, um, you know, executing on, on the basics to, um, you know, to truly helping talent become a, a competitive advantage in the market which is where every company need, needs to be, right? I mean, it is a talent game and, yeah. and it's not a question of just having enough talent, um, you know, thinking about it as headcount, but having the skills that will enable you to be a better competitor in the marketplace. And you, before we get on to the last couple of questions, you, you've talked a lot about listening to employees. The Jam, I think, is a, is a fantastic example of that. Um, one of the one of the the things that when I was at IBM I really loved was the social pulse, and I was, I was thinking firstly to our listeners that don't know what social pulse is, it'd be great if you could explain what social pulse is, and then maybe how that's 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 helped uh, the organisation during the during the crisis. Yeah, so sentiment analysis is where, which is really the broad term for that is is just a continuously listening to employees, but not snooping. And I really want to make that distinction. Mm. In fact, you know, one of the first things that we did when we started using it was to publish our own code of ethics around how we use uh, AI in HR. And the, the headline was just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah. OK, and we're very serious about that in HR. So when we're listening and I put that in quotation marks, we're listening for a negative or positive. We're listening for volume. So if there's a lot of volume around racial inequality, as an example, we know that that's an issue that people care about. If it's a negative volume and it's in a certain country or a certain location, we know that there's something going on there that the HR people need to get involved in. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so that would be an example of how we do it. We're also pulsing questions all the time. And, um, and so every IBM or every few weeks is getting an email, I know that sounds very old, but you know, they do open their emails when it says, how are you doing? Yeah. That's, that's it, how are you doing? And, um, and that's been really helpful because we can see demographics where people are not doing that well. And uh, overall, I'm pleased to say that, you know, generally IBMers are doing well, but we have groups that aren't. And that way we can, we can put together interventions that are really going to help them. For example, working parents, you know, that's a, that's a group of people that are really, um, really struggling with uncertainty. Not, not anything more than that right now because they've already struggled with all the other things for the last few months, but the uncertainty right now is killing them. And so, um, and so there are interventions that will help them manage uncertainty. You know, there, there's, um, there are things that we can do to help them with that. So, so it's, it's, um, it's enabling us to be very um, targeted, very laser focused on the issues that are um, uh, matter to our people. And again, I guess it's using similar techniques that, that, that we've used, uh, that we use on the consumer side, just to, to listen, to understand, and then to act. That's um, right. You know, and provide, the, provide that safety net that, that, that people need, or as you said, there's something happening in a country in the world in a huge organization like IBM, you can make sure that you're applying the right resources there to, to help right. solve, solve the problem. And obviously build on good things that are happening, some, some of the positive stuff, lots of the positive stuff that's happening as well. So yeah, I think it's a good combination. So I think a lot of organizations have been doing a lot of surveys during, during COVID. Yeah. But I think it's having that balance between some of the passive um, stuff and the, and the active stuff as well to really get a good picture of what's happening. 
That's right. And, and you need to have safe spaces for people to be talking where they really, you know, don't feel like they're being snooped on for sure. That's really important. But you do need spaces for people to have those conversations because what if you know what if they don't have it internally they'll be having it externally and it'll affect your brand. Yeah. So you may as well you know make sure that people feel very safe voicing concerns, voicing what they disagree with, and all of that um, internally, and make sure they understand that we're here to listen. We want to learn from this and 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 work with you on it. Um, and uh, and that that does I think help us in a world where we all live in a glass house. Well, we're into the last couple of questions now, um, you know, and we've, we've recently, as I said at the start, celebrated the first year of the podcast. And Ian, our producer, came up with this great idea. Let's ask, ask David anything special. Um, and Dave Ulrich actually posted a couple of questions. Uh, I attempted to answer them. But I think you will come do far better than me on there. So firstly, you know, what gives you the most confidence about the future role of HR in delivering value? Well, that's a great question from David. Um, you know, I think we're we're making a difference in HR because we are now part of the business strategy. And um, and what is that? That's culture and it's talent and it's leadership. Um, and they're to some extent, you know, inextricably linked. But when I think about culture, it's the it's the norms that hold the company together. We talked earlier about COVID and how. It can, it can fray those norms, it can fray those relationships. And the role of HR is to make sure that doesn't happen, that you always have the goodwill um, and the, the, the well of trust that is the foundation of a culture. Yeah. And, um, and, and that, that is really important right now for in, in this era of COVID for HR to, to step up to that. Um, the second thing is, it, Talent is a competitive edge. As I said earlier, if you can find a way to make talent that competitive edge, whether it's through your upskilling or reskilling a machine, how you hire, um, how you select, um, those are all things that give you an edge in the marketplace, right? And AI, of course, can help you with that. And then leadership and being able to uh, I mean, it, again, COVID is demanding a different kind of leader. And, and it's so obvious, the ones that are stepping out and being the kind of leader that people need and the ones that are not, right? And they may have gotten away with it before COVID. Now there's like, you know, it's so obvious, right? So, um, so the, the servant leader, the one that is, um, that is able to draw innovation from their people and give energy to their people, is um, is really important, and again, the role of HR is to help develop those people, and to help select those people, and to reinforce those messages through how they're measured and how they're rewarded, so that it becomes part of the culture. And I suppose the question that, that is, how do we how do we measure the value of of of, 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 what, of HR, what HR is providing to the business? You know, how, how, to, how do you measure the value at, at IBM, for example? And I guess it depends on the, on, 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 on the program or the intervention. That's a really great question. How do we measure the value? I mean, certainly I mentioned uh, net promoter score. Um, and, and so there's a net promoter score of all the experiences that HR has provided, um, whether it's, you know, how, uh, what my experience was of being hired or being onboarded or leaving. That's another one, even if I'm leaving involuntarily. Um, it's, um, it's my experience of my career. It's my experience with any number of things that a company decides are those best moments that they want to, they want to make really memorable. Um, so I think it's that it's also the net promoter score of the employee with the company. In other words, what I recommend this company to another person, um, to a friend, and, um, that is the culmination of so much of what HR does. So I would I would say that's another really good really good metric. If we look at HR moving forward, what gives you the what gives you the most concern about? And I'm not talking about HR and IBM here. I'm talking about HR as a profession. What gives you the most concern about HR um, as we look towards the future? Yeah, it's a great question. I think there's always a danger um, that HR shirks from the new stuff and sticks to the old stuff. And um, a, a great example of that is in COVID, right? There, or, or digitization is another one, or transformation. There's always a tendency for when there's a vacuum for other people to reach in and say that's ours, right? Yeah. It belongs in HR. All that stuff belongs in HR. 
and um, and and we need to upgrade our skills to to adapt to that, right? Um, and it means that we have new new skills. I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. We have super jobs in HR around you know front end developers, around coders. I mean, those people who are in HR now, data scientists. I have 135 of those. So, um, and I didn't hire them either. I mean, I hired some of them, but most of them were developed because that's the new HR. So we need to keep adapting what HR is to the demands and the kind of work that we're doing. Otherwise we'll shrink and we'll be less, less, less relevant. That's great. And we talk about leadership. You, you mentioned obviously how the CEO transition from, from Ginny to Arvind, uh, and it doesn't happen very often in IBM, as I know. Um, so as an, as an HR leader, what are the leadership skills you need to thrive in our digital world? You talked a little bit about that in, in, in connection with COVID, but what, what did you think are the key leadership skills that you need in this new world that we're living in? As an HR leader? As an HR leader, um, or actually just a general, actually, let's do HR and then beyond HR as well, just generally. It's probably pretty similar, actually. I mean, a lot of it is uh, is listening and um, having a having an ability and a willingness to keep growing. Um, and that enables us to deal with every new unexpected event. And we've had many of them in the last few months. So that ability to adapt and renew and grow is, I think, the most important thing. Um, and look, I think the, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, the kind of leader that we need in this moment is a leader that is a servant leader, which yeah. requires democratizing how decisions get made. It means tapping the wisdom of the crowd in all of your decisions. Um, and that is a, that that is uh, all made possible with technology now, right? It's there's there's no excuse. So um, so I think it's um, it's it's a different mindset of a leader. My my role as a leader is to make my people successful and to make decisions tapping their wisdom. Um, it's not to be kind of Solomon <laughs> uh, making the decisions from on high. And that is a, that's just a whole different mindset as a leader. Diane, I think that's a, a great place to, to end it. Some very wise words to, 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 to follow the pun with Solomon, I think, there as well. Thank you for being a guest on the Digital HR Leaders podcast. Can you let listeners know how they can stay in touch with you and, and follow you on, on social media if you're, if you're active on there? Sure, I'm on LinkedIn and um, I welcome anyone to join and I'd be happy to accept you into my network, I think is what we have to do when, uh, when you invite me. So I'd be happy to do that. Diane, thanks again. Thanks very much. Thank you, David. It was fun. In this series, we will be speaking to a range of senior leaders who are pushing a data-driven and digital HR agenda. Make sure that you subscribe by your podcast app of choice and also via our YouTube channel for free and regular interviews with the digital HR leaders of the future.